Uh, we're very happy here to have uh, tonight, coming back to campus, uh, Gabriella Patrick, who's uh, class of uh, 89. Professor Patrick now teaches uh, George Mason uh, University in uh, Virginia, right? And uh, um, she, she has an extensive and uh, 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 tortuous academic career, very interesting <laughs> academic career, uh, uh, related to coming from uh, economics and history here at, at Holy Cross, and then uh, going through the Culinary Institute uh, and uh, uh, you know, institutions such as uh, Carnegie Mellon and uh, University of Delaware, where she got her PhD. She taught also at uh, New York University and then a number of other places, including Australia and California. And uh, she's a, an expert on uh, the, the history of uh, industrial foods and uh, the history of food technology. Uh, and um, is working right now, I guess, uh, I gathered also from, from her uh, um, you know, biography, she's working on uh, two book projects, one uh, that is on uh, uh, the, uh, you know, a, a general uh, book on, on taste that, that is uh, titled uh, uh, Sweet, Sour, Salty, Bitter, Tasting History, and then another uh, book project that uh, is called Industrializing Taste, Food Processing and the Transformation of the American Diet between 1900 and 1965. Tonight, her talk is going to be, uh, the, the topic of the talk is going to be, can industrial food be ethical? I imagine all of you want to hear you know, the answer to that. So let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Patrick here. Uh, and yeah. So, uh, I, I am no philosopher. Um, I, I, I come to thinking about ethics in a really fundamentally different kind of way. And so tonight I'm gonna help, well, I'd like you, help, you to help me think about um, food and democracy in the United States. So we're gonna think about, hopefully, um, approaching it in two different ways. We're gonna approach it from the perspective of a person H.J. Heinz and someone who is near and dear to my heart as well as my home outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and an object, the head of lettuce. In fact, the ubiquitous iceberg lettuce. And so in thinking of these two different ways um, of, of what industrial food can be, both of these both the person and the object were products of a particular point in American history in which the United States is changing fundamentally from a rural environment into an industrial environment. We as people are changing the way we think about and the way that we interact with our world. So, H.J. Hines, what's your favorite ketchup? What, did, what's, what kind of ketchup do you eat? Heinz ketchup. It's America's favorite ketchup. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons it is is because H.J. Heinz worked very hard to perfect the flavor and make sure that it was safe. This is what a canning factory looked like in the 1820s and 1840s. This place is a place where the food coming out of it did not taste very good. You see the farmer coming in from the left-hand side, bringing his products in. His products are not fresh. His products are not the most tasty. They're not the most wonderful objects. He cans what he can't sell on the fresh market. So he's bringing old, decrepit, dried out corn or peas into this rural canning factory where you have a group, mostly women, cutting it off of the cob and stuffing it into little cans and then taking it and boiling it. And you didn't just boil it for 20 or 30 minutes. You boiled it for hours and hours and hours and cooled it down. And you boiled it again for hours and hours and hours and cooled it down. And you boiled it again. So it would take up to 21 hours to make a can of corn in 1830 or 1840. You then you see over here, they're putting little drops of lead. Oh yeah, those cans, they're not so healthy. They're made with lead solder, they're made with tin. If you put tomatoes in it, they would rust and pit, anything acid. So what I'm trying to convey to you when we think about pre-industrial canned foods, they're not particularly safe and they're not particularly tasty. 
It takes a lot of science and technology to actually move us forward. So when we think about industrial America, we think of it in a Dickensian kind of place. This is Pittsburgh. Industrial America was considered hell with the lid off. It was smoky, it was dirty, it was brutal place to live and work. Um, we need to think about the transition in American history from a rural place of those rural canning factories to an industrial sphere where people are working in coke plants and um, large steel mills where people are not paid well, they're new immigrants, they don't understand the culture or, or the society in which they're living. Um, it's a pretty brutal place, and yet we need to feed these people, and how do you do that? It's not a particularly um, pleasant or a particularly um, nice place to live. In the early 20th century, one of the reasons that industrial foods are given such a bad rap is because it really wasn't very good for you. There's a whole set of, of um, newspaper articles, particularly in the New York Times. Between about 1880 and 1930, there are over 700 articles just like these three. Sardines made them ill, a family poisoned by sandwiches of canned fish, 50 now dead from eating herring, 15 expired yesterday and 70 cases are reported in Berlin hospitals. A poison plot, some declare. Tomains overcome four poisoning, four persons. Three women and a child were overcome by tomain poisoning after eating canned soup last night in their home at 60 West 15th Street. One of the victims dragged herself along the floor to the, to the hall to her neighbor's apartment and made their plate known and telephone message was sent to West 25th Street Station and brought policeman Nevins, who gave first aid treatment. Dr. Seavers of the New York Hospital revived Miss Lydia Elderman and Miss Caroline Hartman. The other sufferers, Miss Hilda Ehold and John Frank, three years old, were sent to the hospital for further treatment. The police sent a sample of the soup to the Department of Health analysis for analysis. These were not atypical features that you would see it with throughout the papers of the United States. Again, those who suffered from food poisoning were both the young and the old. Anzia Yezierska, has any of you guys ever heard of her? She is a, um, a prolific fiction writer. This is her semi-autobiographical novel called The Bread Givers, which is about Eastern European Jews on the Lower East Side of New York City. But she writes, poor little heart, motherless lamb, Bessie sobbed, rushing over to him. He lay back so weak, his big old eyes staring at the ceiling. Suddenly he screamed, clenched his little hands and drew up his knees in pain. Then he laid straight, like one um, straight and stiff like one dead. Bessie put her hand on his face. He's burning up with fever. Quick, run for the doctor, she cried. Mother, are you my mother? He whispered Benny, putting his arms around her in his weak weakness, trying to hug her. Your child has been eating food that poisoned him. And the doctor pointed to the open can of beans on the table. These scenes were not at all atypical, and they struck great fear into the hearts of most Americans. This is Harvey Washington Wiley. He was the chief of the Bureau of Chemistry, and he led a group of young men in which he fed lots of things that were in, supposedly in adulterated foods, bringing the cause of poisoned food to the United States. Now, Harvey Washington Wiley, he's a bit of a self-absorbed guy, and um, he's a bit of a showboater. Now, his poison squads, while they did bring attention to poison food, they were not good science, and most of his results were actually ultimately shown to be false. But he did, in, relation, in conjunction with H.J. Hines, work very hard for pure, pure food le legislation in the early 20th century, which is the Pure Foods and Drugs Act of 1906. It was not Upton Sinclair, by the way. He's all about meat, not about the rest of it. But um, in conjunction with Henry Hines, um, they both worked very hard because they saw the state of food in industrial America as being a bit of a mess. And they both thought that there was a better way to do it. Now, the reason I'm talking about H.J. Hines is I'm from Pittsburgh. I have to confess. I don't eat ketchup. I don't really like ketchup. Um, but I really do like H.J. Hines. And this is where sometimes as a historian, maybe I'm a bad historian, but you know, you kind of 
really like some of the people that you study. He was an extremely religious man. He was a Lutheran um, by birth. His mother was very, very, very strict. And if the children ever missed church, she would memorize the sermon and repeat it back to them when they got home. Um, and he practiced his business. And the reason that he did not become a minister, he went to seminary and ultimately did not become a Lutheran minister, largely because he felt there was something else to do with his life. He started out making bricks, big fan of the brick. If you look at the Heinz plant, it's a beautifully constructed brick building for those of you interested in architecture. Um, but more importantly, he started a food company. And he started out very small, and he started out peddling around the Pittsburgh area. He went broke in 1875, huge, terrible um, disaster of a depression. But he, he, he made a commitment to paying off all of his creditors and then went to his cousin and his wife, a story that's not often told. His wife actually helped finance his second business. But he, was, he thought that food should be for the masses. And he thought that good food should be for the masses. And he fought very hard with Harvey Washington Wiley to prevent um, canners who were not producing sanitary foods, who were not producing good, wholesome food at a reasonable price that they should be put out of business. Some historians have argued that he's just in it for the money. I think that he is not, largely because he was such a religious man and he actually practiced this every day of his life. This this idea of applied Christianity, as in do every day what you would want others to do for you. And he's one of the few people that I would argue actually does that. So out of his diary in 1879, this is one of the entries that I think um, uh, exemplifies who he is as a person. I find in, in counting up, we fed 43 tramps and beggars during the month of January in 31 days. The majority, we sat to the kitchen table and gave them coffee and warm victuals as it was very cold. We gave some of them work as to earn money for their lodging. And so this is a, this is a very wealthy um, entrepreneur in one of the most affluent industrial cities in the United States, bringing very poor people into his own home, into his own kitchen table, with his wife actually cooking for them. This is highly unusual behavior. You have to remember that the Carnegies, the Mellons, and the Fricks are all part of his cohort. These are, these are very wealthy men in the Pittsburgh area who would never have done any of this. There's a woman named Elizabeth Beardsley Butler. She worked for the Russell Sage Foundation. And her job was to go around and look at the poverty of industrial America. And so she came to Pittsburgh in 18, excuse me, in 1909 and did a study. And one of the places that she visited was the Heinz factory. And she had no love for H.J. Heinz or industrialization at all. And yet she finds in his factory that the raw fruit, fruits gathered in hundred, along a hundred converging railroad lines from Michigan, Illinois, and Indiana are transformed by the industrial alchemy and sent out in bottles and tins to um, innumerable local eateries. And so she's noticing that, that not only the linkages between um, rural America and industrial America, but also the place of large food manufacturers who are essentially making very safe food. So what happened to Benny doesn't happen to many, 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 many other children. So this is a little bit of a peek inside of his factory. I will confess it is a little bit of a staged photograph. But these are young women that he employed. If he did not employ these women, they would largely be unemployed. They could be prostitutes. Um, they could be doing other innumerable things. They might be working in a screw factory, which is much more dangerous, much more dirty. Truth be said, the job wasn't so great. The average woman lasted about two years within the factory, but she did have her own, her own means and earn her own income. He hired largely Slavic women. One of the things you will notice is um, there's not a lot of ethnic diversity. They're largely white women. Um, they are largely interestingly enough, pretty women. He, um, there, there was a sense of you had to have the right look to work in his, so he's not completely virtuous. He's not 
not a chauvinist, by the way, but he did provide a very unique space for women within the factory itself. He also did a couple of other things. He believed in welfare capitalism. There are scholars that will, will argue that welfare capitalism was a shill that kept unions out, and it was nothing but um, uh, a, a travesty for workers. In looking at others who have practiced it, as well as Heinz, you know, there was something that good that came out of it. There was a space for people. Um, he provided uh, rides in the park. He provided, and my sister and niece who are here, who have, um, who have been to Idlewild Park will perhaps recognize this photograph. Um, they, he would rent a train and take everyone in the factory on a summer vacation, essentially. He is, um, his brother-in-law, Sebastian Mueller, if you know of Chatham University, they have a new campus outside of Pittsburgh, which was the retirement home for women from the factory, which he provided. Um, he was also very big in Pittsburgh, known for you need your lights on in the middle, even in the 1950s, in the middle of the day, for the soot and smog. Um, advocated for less smoke um, and smoke abatement to make living in the city much, much, much easier and um, more healthful for people. Truth be told, it didn't go all that far. You know, still built the city. Um, so the Carnegies were not so hot on that. The other thing that he did, and probably the most important thing that he and many other food manufacturers did, was employ technology. This is the patent for Andrew K. Schreiber um, for what is termed a very fancy term called a steam retort. It's a big pressure cooker. So what it is is a big tin with a perforated bottom that lets steam come up through the bottom so I don't have to cook it for that 12 and, or that 21 hours anymore. I can now put all of my cans in there and cook it for about five hours. The quality of the food and the ability to control bacterial contamination through this piece of technology revolutionized canned food. So people like Benny are no longer getting food um, are no longer dying from, from things like foodborne illness or botulism. And botulism was a tremendous um, fear of most people eating any sort of canned food. I should also sort of back up and say, by the way, most people aren't eating canned food. Most people don't eat canned food until the 1930s. It's just too expensive. Um, people in the 1800s are eating canned food. Our soldiers, our naval um, uh, midshipmen, are people moving across the Trans-Mississippi West towards the West Coast, people who do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Even in the 1930s, as I'll show you in a little bit, most people are eating fresh fruits and fresh foods. But this is a revolutionary piece of technology that only the largest food producers like Heinz and Campbell's can afford to, to use. The other thing that happens in the late 19th century is the can. Before you can mechanize a can, every can has to be, be made by hand. You have many, and Heinz employed probably 200 men to make cans. A good can maker can make about 60 cans a day. It's not very many. Um, once you get a machine like this, which is invented by the Ames, Charles Ames of the Ames Manufacturing Company, which becomes American Can, otherwise known as Canco, um, uh, it takes between the 1880s and 1911 to actually perfect a machine that can make and ma industrialize can production. So you go from making 60 cans uh, a day for an individual can maker to making 60,000 cans a day. So you can't, literally cannot scale up um, to be able to make large amounts of canned food. Um, you also have a very fancy um, seal that you use, um, and it's called a double folding, that you fold it over and you lock the top of the can on. Um, it's very kind of, it's a little complicated to do this, and they had a lot of trouble, even though they had the cans, 
of filling them to the right height and making them not explode, they exploded all the time. Um, and getting the right amount of space. You know, in thinking about the can as a technology itself, it's not only you gotta make sure what you put into it is pure, you have to make sure you understand what's going on inside the can itself. Because what happens, and you guys know what happens if you heat up a can? It expands, thank you. Yes, it expands. It heats up, it boils, right? And you expand it if it's not sealed properly and you don't have a coating and a gasket in between these layers, you're not gonna have a can when you, when you um, open up your steam retort. So these are some of the dangers of a can. The first one is a good can. It's concave on both sides. The second one is what they call a springer or a flipper. So a springer is you press down on it. Anyone, you guys have all seen a baby food jar, right? That little, that little button on the top. Well, if your can pushes down, it's probably not good. It's not sealed properly. And a flipper is when I press down on one end, it will flip out on the other. Also probably not good. That doesn't mean that the food inside is spoiled. It simply means that it may have been filled too much. But as a consumer, you don't care because it could be dangerous. And then of course the swell is a telltale sign of botulism or you filled it too high or it's the summer in Georgia and it's really hot in that warehouse. And then come winter when it cools down, it will shrink back to its regular size. So it's very, very, very challenging and difficult to figure out what is and is not safe food. And it's only through the application of science, technology, and experience that large companies like the H.J. Heinz Company or Campbell's Company or Libby's McNeil and Libby, um, you know, Libby's, Libby's, uh, Libby's on the label, 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 um, that those large companies can actually guarantee the safety of what you're eating. And so they hired guys like this. The term a sound can is literal of you tap the can to make sure it sounds right. There's a, a, a definite ding to it, a solidness to it that they would make sure. And they would store these for months at a time because it takes months for botulism or other contamination to actually um, show up inside. And there are some forms of con contamination you couldn't even tell. Um, they're called sours, um, which you really need scientists to figure out. But Heinz took this to the public, so they had very, very fancy advertising and marketing campaigns. We like to think today that marketers are sophisticated. Turn of the century, those guys were really sophisticated. They pretty much invented almost everything um, about marketing. But what we can see in 1916 is declare your independence from impure foods. This idea that you have to rely on the large corporations, and you really did. This is, this is, those small rural canneries were the ones that were gonna make you sick. The ones with the generic labels on it where you didn't know and you didn't know a brand. We tend to think of branding and marketing as sort of, and we can perhaps have a good argument about that, as being somewhat manipulative and, and, and um, conning consumers. At the turn and in the early 20th century, that was not the case. There were absolutely a guarantee of quality. If you did not like the product, any of it could go back. And, and housewives who um, bought something from a grocer who did not like it could take it back to the grocer and you had someone to go complain to. Not only did you go back to the grocer, the grocer went back to the salesman, and the salesman went back to the H.J. Heinz company. And there was a direct feedback loop to the company, not only on the quality of the products, but on the taste and flavor. And they did adjust their recipes. Ketchup in 1890, there are five kinds of ketchup, none of which were tomato. There's walnut, there's grape, there's mushroom. By 1920, Oh, Emily, you're screwing up your nose. Um, uh, uh, by 1920, ketchup is tomato ketchup. And so you get these wild swings in what the public will accept. And so large companies like, like Heinz actually responded quite readily to what consumers wanted and what they wanted to buy. The other thing that Heinz did on marketing, we like to think, you know, I remember one Walmart, 
a million years ago started doing tastings inside and grocery stores started doing tastings thinking it was new and innovative. Again, the way that H.J. Hines got people to say, hey, industrial foods are not scary. I trust this particular band, brand was by going to large food expositions. They went to the Philadelphia Exposition in 1876. They went to the Chicago Exposition in 1893. This is the San Francisco Panama um, Exposition to, for the opening of the Panama Canal, in which you have lovely women serving you tasty morsels of food. So there's a woman here. Those are salesmen back there. We can talk about the racial dynamics of food if you would like. Um, not quite such a happy story, but there's a way in which the selling and the marketing of this um, also ensures the quality, and these two things are tied. Because you can trace back everything you buy from these large companies, it's a lot safer to purchase from them. And so to get back to Benny for a minute, Got a poor little guy, got a half a can of open baked beans on the table. Chances are, it really wasn't the baked beans on the table that made him sick. Well, it was, it just wasn't the can. And it wasn't the commercial canning that made him sick. Because companies like Heinz use that steam retort, they could pretty much guarantee that their foods were safe. What made him sick is this, the ice box. The average temperature in an ice box Using a cake of ice is 40 degrees. 40 degrees is prime temperature to make you really sick, particularly with something like baked beans, which is very high in protein and high in water. So if Benny had stored a can of beans in an ice box the night before and taken it out, a lot of people in those articles were sick not because of industrial foods, but because they didn't understand how to store foods. And there was simply not the industrial infrastructure and the refrigeration infrastructure to ensure that actually the foods that they were eating were safe. To be honest, I wouldn't want to eat anything in this ice box. Um, and ice boxes are, are um, notoriously leaky and the ice is notoriously dirty until you have a system where you can actually manufacture ice. Um, and so the mechanization of ice boxes and ice boxes moving into homes, most people did not have ice boxes in the United States. So eating was a daily affair in which you bought everything and you cooked everything every day. And it was dangerous for a whole set of innumerable infrastructure questions that rely on um, refrigeration, and transportation, which I'll talk a little bit more about in iceberg lettuce. So iceberg lettuce, this is Salinas, California. Um, and this is a shot in the 1970s looking um, eastward. Um, and it is the, it, they term themselves the salad bowl of the world. It is the largest uh, manufacturer of lettuce in the United States. It, it, it um, essentially used to be in the world, but we get our fresh fruits and vegetables from uh, Salinas. So this is a map of lettuce production. So in 1925, there were two kinds of lettuce, essentially, in the United States. There was East Coast lettuce and there was West Coast lettuce. Big Boston is produced in upstate New York and the southeast of uh, the United, in the southeast states. Iceberg lettuce is produced in the western states. Um, lettuce cultivation is not big in 1920. There's very little lettuce eaten or shipped any place in the country. It is not America's favorite food, but it becomes that. Um, it is hard to, to uh, produce. You use a lot of animal labor. Um, Tractors don't move on to the American land in any sort of large sense until World War II. There are some in the 1930s. Um, but if you're trying to make lettuce in the 1920s, you're using mules. It is heavily labor intensive. Every head of lettuce, even today, that you eat is picked by an individual. Those little baby lettuces you like, I love. They're easy, they're triple washed. Those are far more industrial than a head of iceberg lettuces. You would pick them by hand and crate them 
to the end of rows and there's a lot of lugging and hauling that goes on. There is a gender split in the way that you um, process and manufacture it. You haul it in in these huge bins and it becomes layered in ice. Right. So you take a layer of ice, you put, ice, you put a, a row of lettuce in, you add another layer of ice, you put another um, uh, row of ice on it. The reason that iceberg lettuce becomes truly industrialized is because I can manufacture tons of ice. At the peak season in the 1930s, these producers are using over 15 tons of ice a day. The other thing is Big Boston, it's a beautiful bib lettuce, very soft, very buttery. It can't be packed in ice. Whereas iceberg lettuce, by its very nature, fits into an industrial section, into an industrial sector, so I can actually mass produce it. I can put it in a rail car north of Salinas, California, and blow two tons of shaved ice on top of it and not have to worry, well, you have to worry a little, um, but I can ensure that it gets to New York within about 19 days. The shelf life of a head of iceberg lettuce is about 21 days. Um, but I can fit it, but iceberg lettuce fits in into, into an industrial structure that already exists. And so I can mass produce it, and so I can actually, for the first time, have a vegetable that's available year-round. Before that, no vegetables available year-round, let alone something green and leafy that's full of vitamin A, that's full of vitamin C. It gets a bad rap. Iceberg lettuce, everyone says, oh, it's so terrible. It has no, it's, it's just, it's all full of water and it has no nutrients. You'd be lucky to have it in 1930. Um, and it's not that all of it was the best I lettuce you ever ate. And in fact, um, in urban cities in the springtime when you could get dandelions and you could get spinach and you could get arugula, everybody bought those other bitter greens. But in January, when the only fresh vegetable you could get was lettuce, everybody bought an iceberg. And so those that production in 1925, what we see is, where does it go? It goes to those urban cities on the East Coast. You have a suck of fresh produce from California to Chicago and Pittsburgh and New York and Philadelphia and Boston where all those women in Heinz factories are working and all those guys in the steel mills and the radio manufacturing companies and over, I think, I think it's Haverhill, the shoe factories, um, over uh, in Western Mass, where all the shoe factories used to be. Um, you're feeding people these fresh fruits and vegetables. And this is not some sort of marketing scheme. It's that consumers really wanted better fruits and vegetables. And so what we can see through the object of lettuce, in 18 and, between 1818 and 1920, you're lucky to eat two and a half heads per capita. By 1947, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve and a half heads per capita. It is astronomical the volume of lettuce that Americans eat um, in, uh, in less than 20 years. Lettuce is one of those things that's weird. Canned foods takes 30 or 40 years for us to eat and accept within our diets as Americans. Iceberg lettuce takes less than 10, where it becomes the most consumed vegetable. The other thing that we can see is, in the United States, indu an industrial infrastructure allows us to eat far more fresh fruits and vegetables. Canning explodes, but per capita, we're eating about two or three cans in 1925. Um, what we see between 1910 and 1950 is the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables we eat is astronomical based on that infrastructure of refrigeration, roads, railroads, um, and uh, distribution centers. Um, we're also eating a heck of a lot more fats and oils. Um, and what we notice most starkly is that grains, the starches, bread, bread, 
potatoes, um, cereals go way, way, way down as a portion of what we eat. Um, this is, is um, the next iteration of technology with uh, uh, lettuce production, which is it's called a vacuum cooler. So you think about, um, I always like to explain it as evaporation. So you know when you sweat, you, you got the bead on your arm and you sweat and it evaporates and you get cooler? That's what happens with this machine. You drop, you make it into a vacuum. It literally evaporates from the inside of the head out. In the 1920s and 30s, you'd lose 20 to 30% of all the lettuce you produced in transit because it was too warm when you picked it in the field. If I toss it in this little contraption, which I'll show you a better picture of in a second, I can almost ensure it cools it from the inside out. I can ensure that almost 90% of my lettuce gets to market. And so in about three years, you go from this little tiny machine, which the original one's like as big as me, it's about 16 inches and I can put, or it's about 16 feet, I can put about 20 boxes in it to something I can load a whole tractor trailer in. And I don't need an entire infrastructure and I can reduce my labor costs. Now, we'll be honest, kind of sucked for the workers because they all lost their jobs. Um, and it was not, uh, it, it made lettuce cheaper, but it did have a lot of human cost. And ultimately what we end up with by the 19, um, mid 1960s is literally removing the packing sheds completely and putting um, the packing shed on a truck um, out into the field. And we can have a conversation about what that means for labor and the labor dynamics and the racial labor dynamics of what goes on in the Salinas fields. But I will tell you that the laborers in lettuce are not migrant workers. They're Salinas workers, they live in Salinas, and they move with the tractors and the trucks between California and Arizona. There's a whole different set of migrant laborers, but um, in lettuce, they're a bit unusual. And, and there are some different racial dynamics that happens um, within the lettuce. But at the end of the day, there is a system, and there's a, there, is, there was a particular moment in time in which when we we think about in both industrial infrastructure and when we think about the companies who make the food that are, are more than 100 years old, I mean, Heinz is up on its sesquicentennial, 150 year anniversary, as is Campbell's, there are some traces and traits within an industrial system that are both nutritious and equitable. Early on, all of these products, whether it's lettuce or canned food or ketchup are extremely expensive expensive and only available to the middle class. By mid-century, anybody can buy Heinz ketchup. Anybody can buy a can of Campbell's soup. Anybody can buy a head of lettuce. May have been a little wilted, may have been a little dry, but certainly by the 1970s, these foods are, are opportunities and they really we can talk about meat as well, which is not a case study I'm using, but we can talk about the availability of having food for the masses of Americans. And uh, you know, I essentially believe that there's a very democratic element. And perhaps I would be the first to say, in the 70s and in the 80s, we probably made some really bad choices, but that doesn't mean, one, we need to continue to make bad choices, but at the same, that industrial foods are necessarily bad foods, or they're not something that has facilitated a lot of creativity, um, a lot of opportunity within our own society. Thanks. Are there any questions? So, so the first Heinz cookbook goes back to 1899. And I, it's really kind of funny because it's um, aimed at, at middle class women and it's aimed at when it's the cook's night off. Um, and so there is this very interesting class dynamic um, about who does what. And I, there's this one um, sort of back and forth between a husband and wife in which she puts down this lovely salad. And he's like, oh, the cooked salad is so lovely. And she's like, I made that. Little does she say it was Heinz olive oil 
and Heinz vinegar. That was what she put on it and not giving them proper credit. So she didn't actually do much, but she puts the dressing on the lettuce and it's this wonderful thing. So it goes back, you know, again, it goes these marketing um, strategies of trying to convince people that this stuff one tastes any good um, and that it's worth buying and it's worth the price and that it's actually safe for your family. The other thing I sort of didn't mention on marketing, and as I said, I had like 78 slides to start and I had to cut it down. Um, but some of, a lot of the advertising is actually geared towards saving your children. And so feeding your children, when, you, when we think about someone like Benny, he's little, he's a little kid, and the most vulnerable populations to foodborne illness today or yesterday are the very young and they're very old. And so they really do try, in, and part of this was, there was a huge sense of anxiety at the turn of the 20th century about feeding your children right, so you don't, literally do not kill them. Milk killed a lot of children. Undulant fever, which we now know as brucellosis, um, killed lots of it. Tuberculosis, bovine tuberculosis, you feed your kid um, tubercular milk, you're giving your child tuberculosis, not necessarily airborne. There's a tremendous amount of anxiety that you really were bringing death into your household. And so these brand name products brought some sense of security. So a very, a very um, wonderful historian named Nancy Toms has written about this. Um, and she argues that, that you really did bring death into the family. So brand names m made it so that w middle class women didn't need to worry quite so much. Poor working class women, they, it kind of really sucked for them. They had a lot more issues, and we can go into their issues with milk if you'd like. So the lining of cans, has, um, it's a double-edged sword. So early on when you didn't line cans, you had a lot of leaching from the can itself. Particularly, you know, I forgot to, well, I didn't forget to mention, but those early cans, that was all lead solder, and you used lead solder the inside. So the can itself made you, could make you sick and give you lead poisoning. Um, and so the BPA and the coatings has been a constant struggle since the 1920s. And the, the BPA, you know, it, it's, 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 it is, it's hard to know what to do about something like that because it's so ubiquitous. And the industry certainly is reticent to remove it because if you remove it, you're gonna open literally another set of can of words of, of a technological issue. You really, there's no good solution to it yet. I do know that they are trying to work on some of that and they're trying to do less with BPA, but the problem is at this point, there's no great solution. And you know, a lot of that is gonna come with federal regulation. Just like today, um, in the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of commentary about antibiotics and subclinical use of antibiotics with animals. And so that's been a concern since the 1970s. It really goes back to the 1950s if you read the trade literature on meat um, and the veterinary stuff in the trade guides. And so you know they don't wanna do it because the antibiotics make the meat fatter, it grows faster, it makes, it puts more money in the cattleman's pocket. Um, and so that's gonna be a legislative. And so what I think we're gonna see, although I'm a historian, I don't like to predict the future, but my prediction is we're gonna actually see, because the public has become much, much more concerned in the last 25 years than we have been in a very, very, very long time, that there's gonna be a lot of federal pushback on lots of dif different things. And BPA is probably one of those things that in the next five to 10 years, you're probably gonna see a lot less of around. Hopefully, anyway. There are many people out there who argue that home economists and sort of the early social workers, um, and particularly um, Helen Swallow Richards from MIT, who founded the home economics movement, um, were really influential in changing the way people eat. But when we actually look at the evidence, they had no purchase at all. So when we look at the um, New England kitchen here in Boston, what we find is it was a complete and utter disaster. The immigrants hated what the home economists had to say. So what happens, and I, I, it's more for me an economic, this is, the, you know, I'm a recovering econo economist. Um, the, it's the economic model. At what we see is what actually when real income rises, that's when we see more fresh fruits and vegetables coming in. And so it's, for me, it's much more an argument not about nutritional advice, but much more about people knew how to eat, particularly, there are lots of Italians, right? Southern Italians. If you look at the Southern Italian diet before immigration, it's, it's, it's a pretty healthy vegetable-based diet. And so when you can afford to now, um, and, and it's not just lettuce that you can produce more. If you're producing carrots, you're producing oranges, there's a whole s set 
of fruits and vegetables that are moving into cities, bananas. There's a whole, a friend of mine wrote a book on bananas that, that, that you can now afford to purchase on a regular basis because the prices have come down. So I think it's much more about economics and I, I don't actually buy into the, the nutritional advice, mostly because as I tell my nutrition students, we've been giving nutritional advice for a century and we really haven't gotten anywhere. People don't listen. People do not change what they eat, the, when t especially when someone sort of tries to ram it down your throat. And, and again, you don't have home economics in high schools yet. That comes later. That comes after World War I. So most of the United States is not getting the advice that you're thinking that they're getting. The reality is actually Heinz hired more African Americans in Pittsburgh than almost any other place. Um, so he wasn't, he wasn't a good guy and he wasn't a bad guy. But and where he, the way he hired African Americans into the factory was always at the worst and lowest levels. So he sort of fits into you know, the way we think of African American labor in urban environments as being um, overworked and underpaid and all and essentially racially discriminated. Um, he did hire African Americans at a slightly higher rate, but you know, most of the pictures you don't see them. He had a chauffeur who was African American, um, who he took pretty good care of when he died. I mean, he, he actually had a, um, actually left him an inheritance, but at the same time, he is a product of his times, and it's, you know, it's the, the story you expect to hear. Is, is, is there a part of it I could answer better? No, okay. What happens inside the food, what can talk about is what happens inside the food industry more generally, is that um, as white Americans move out and find better paying jobs, African Americans move in. And so you have sort of this hierarchy, and it's, it, you can see it best in the meat industry. So as white Americans are moving out, whatever your ethnicity, whether you're Slavic or Italian, and you're moving into car factories or um, into steel plants around Detroit or Gary, Indiana, African American men move in. African American women in the slaughterhouses always had the absolutely worst jobs ever. And if we look at chicken plants, it's the same thing. You have a, a fairly predictable um, uh, racial uh, uh, progression. So it goes from African Americans. So now um, Hispanics largely fill that, that same gap. So if we look in any sort of food processing in the lowest paid, worst jobs, they're always highly, they've been highly racialized and they're still highly racialized. We go from the turn of the century where meat packing is a highly skilled job to the 1980s when it becomes an essentially an assembly line de-skilled job. And as that, you have that arc, it goes from high paying to low paying, it goes from white to different racial and ethnic groups. A little bit of a story. Um, I've been a food snob most of my life. My sister can attest to that. Um, and uh, I, but in doing this project, I've really come to appreciate industrial food. What I think has happened in the between the mid 1960s and 1990, we, we, we what emerges what I'll call hyper industrial food. And so when I talk about hyper industrial food. I'm talking about Doritos, I'm talking about Twinkies, I'm talking about all of that other kind of stuff, which has a place in our diet. It just shouldn't have a primary place. And we, the profit motivation for, for, for companies were around those foods and not about canned peas. And so the reality is the food, food corporations will make whatever we want. Um, it has to be profitable for them. And what we've seen, Heinz now, I love it. Heinz has a five ingredient ketchup. Five ingredients. I'm like, dang, it's 1920, right? And so if, if we as a society push back, not only on, on the food corporations, but also on our federal regulators, which are a big part of this. They've allowed us to substitute high fructose corn syrup in our ketchup instead of putting tomatoes in it. And so there's a way as we as a society have a responsibility to say, no, we're done with this. But at the same time, we have to recognize that there's gonna be an economic cost to that. And so it's a very fine line. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a person who really wants to have good nutritious food available to all Americans. And that, that you know, um, 
that it's not just available to middle class or, or wealthy or those people who decide, I'm willing to give up half of my income to, to spend this and, and make a lifestyle choice. And so there's a lot to be said for availability. I've been working on some projects in New York on obesity issues and access and some things I'm working on at, in Virginia as well about rethinking the location of food, new food distribution systems, breaking up some of the monopoly power of the largest companies, Monsanto, Cargill, um, uh, ADM, but you know, also thinking about local communities and how local communities can make changes in, in their own spaces, um, whether you're very poor or, or very affluent, and sort of pushing back on that. But that's also highly regulatory as well and holding our, our politicians accountable for what we want. Well, I, wouldn't be the, I would not be the first person to say that you can't go to McDonald's and eat um, more calories more cheaply than going to the grocery store, because you can. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. Um, th that and, and the fact that we put, that there are more McDonald's per capita in the poorest neighborhoods of the United States is probably, as well as, alco as, as, well as alcohol outlets and, and places where you can buy alcohol, that's by design, and that's, that's about zoning, and that's about neighborhoods thinking about what they want. One of the things that has happened in the late 20th century, particularly um, between about 1965 and 1975, what we've seen is supermarkets are no longer in our poorest communities, and they've shifted to um, much smaller places where it's much more difficult to get any sort of healthy food. And the other thing we know is that those supermarkets, when they were in poorer communities, always had worse food. I was talking earlier at dinner about when I was here down the hill, there was actually a store down the hill, and how awful the produce was and how I would never shop there, because you would have to be dumb to buy the, the shriveled up apple and the shriveled up um, produce. And so there's a way in which buying a head of iceberg glaze is pretty cheap, buying that box of organic lettuce is not. And so there is a way, and again, this goes back to regulatory issues. As a society, we have decided to fund soybean, rice, corn, dairy products, sugar, and cotton. That's what's in the Farm Bill. What's not in the Farm Bill is lettuce and tomatoes and cucumbers and um, uh, carrots. There has been a new initiative in the last Farm Bill to try to start to change some of that. If you care, email your congressman, your senator, and talk about what's going to be happening in our next Farm Bill, which isn't going to happen this year because of the election, but in the following year about providing more incentive for fresh, where they're called specialty crops, specialty crop producers to drive down the cost because it is more expensive. It, it is expensive to eat healthfully. You can eat less healthfully in you know, that mac and cheese on the, on the shelf, which I ate when I was in college, because it was I could get five boxes for a dollar. It's a rational economic decision. So some of that's just about the way we as a society have chosen to put priorities on which foods and which farmers. And I could go on about the farmers and the incentives of why we ended up with those five or six but, but we end up with that because of a lot of politics over the course of the 20th century and which, which products we think are best and which feed, meat, which feed meat largely. That corn and soy goes to meat production. And so those are, those are choices we've made so we can make different choices. All right, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.